Who was Tyr? And did Odin replace him as the head of the Old Norse Pantheon? This is a question that I hear a lot, but is never satisfactorily answered. So let me answer it for you. And along the way, we'll further look into some mythology about why a king would lose a hand. And my conclusion will probably surprise you. I'm John White, and welcome to Krakenfall. So to those that are new here, my videos have subtitles, chapters and references in their description to help you consume the information here in a way that suits you. And it also has a like, subscribe and notification bell. If you press this, it will support me and will help this YouTube channel grow and let other people know to watch this video. And with that, please grab yourself a cup of tea and I shall begin. So let's start off by answering the main question and that is, was Tyr ever the head of the Old Norse Pantheon? And the answer to that, the short answer to that is no. But we have to consider that the Old Norse Pantheon and the Old Norse period therefore tends to date from about the 7th century CE to the early Middle Ages and covers the culture and population that originated in Denmark, Norway, Sweden and Iceland. And we know at this time and in these places Odin, Freyr and Thor were always the main deities. Although the chief deity out of these three did change depend on when you were and where you were. But it was usually one of those three gods. And so what we need to do is to ask a better question. Or oh, this will be a very short video. And the question or questions we must ask are, who was Tyr? Was he ever the head of any of the major Indo-European pantheons? And what makes people think Tyr was the head of a pantheon? And then if Tyr was the head of a pantheon, then why did Odin replace him? Now, the short answer to all these questions is that it's complicated. In fact, most videos on this subject tend to last about 10 minutes or so, but then they skip some of the most interesting etymological and mythological considerations. And that is because answering these questions is a bit of a minefield due to the lack of direct evidence and attestations uh, to the structure of the pantheons in the Bronze and Iron Ages. And so this leads to a level of speculation. But it is interesting to discuss these things, despite the frowns from fellow academics, you know, about the academic value of this, of speculation. And I think that what I'm about to tell you will teach you some things you may not already know about mythology and the gods of Northwestern Europe. Now, let's start by understanding that the period of time before the Old Norse culture is often referred to by different names, such as Proto-Norse or Old Scandinavian when the timelines we're interested in are happening, so before 500 CE, so over 1500 years ago. Now whilst our historic knowledge of this period and the cultures is, is relatively minimal due to a lack of attestation, we do know uh, a few things and we can use these to get some ideas about what could have been going on. For us, this is the time of the Bronze Ages and the Iron Ages, the time where many European cultures go through much change as technology evolves to take advantage of the new metals and the wealth and power um, adapts to this new technology. And then at the time of the Iron Age, there is this religious revolution that heads to Europe with the help of the Romans, and that's called Christianity. And as the Roman Empire expands and there is a natural evolution of existing pantheons as well. And all these things will have an impact on the reasoning behind what I'm going to tell you today. So first off, let's answer the easiest part of these other questions, which is why are people asking whether Tyr could have been the head of a pantheon at some point in time? Now, some of you may already be aware of this, but for those who are not, the answer is to do with the etymology of the word Tyr, you know, the meaning of the word. And the answer, to what this meaning is, is that Tyr is a linguistic derivative or, or something that we refer to as a cognate of the Proto-Indo-European Zeus or Indo-European Zeus, which evolved into the Greek Zeus and the Roman Jupiter, and the name then evolved further into the Proto-Germanic Tiwaz and the High German Zeal, and cross into England as the Old English uh, Tig before evolving into T. Uh, it's also cognate with the Old Indian word Deva, and the Irish deer and Latin D, all of which mean God. But in the Nordic countries, the cognate was Tyr. And this means Tyr could be considered cognate with the Proto-Indo-European's chief God. 
their sky father, Zeus, Putta. And so it would seem right to theorise that the Indo-European Zeus Putta probably evolved into the Norse Tyr. And if so, why wouldn't Tyr have led the Norse pantheon like the Sky Father did in the Russian steppes in the time of the Proto-Indo-Europeans? Well, the answer isn't a definite yes, because this is complicated. Yeah, there are challenges in this thinking, so let's look at these. Well, the first being that all surviving sources of Norse myth, in all of them, there is no mention of Tyr as having a position of a lead god or a chief of the pantheon. And there is no attestation saying that Odin took over from Tyr either, which again would infer Tyr's role as a chief god. And we have no uh, information that directly attests to Tyr being a sky god or having a sky father role. And on this basis, things really don't look good for the theory, you know, and, and answering the questions in a positive manner that Tyr was the head of a pantheon. And so to expand on this, Tyr is also a generic word for God, and if the word or a variation of the word Tyr is mentioned anywhere, we have to establish if it is being used as a name for the god called Tyr, or as a general word for God. And this is an important issue, as there are other gods' names, such as Freyr, who have a similar issue to this, you know, in the sense that Freyr is best described as meaning Lord. I mean, it isn't a personified name of a god, we believe Freyr's personified name is probably Yngvi. Now, a second issue with this is that the Old Norse pantheon bears little resemblance to the Proto-Indo-European pantheon, in terms of names of gods that are cognate with earlier gods. So another question to ask is, why would Tyr be cognate with Zeus Putter when almost no other gods in the Old Norse pantheon have a name that is cognate with another Proto-Indo-European god? Surely more than one god would have migrated to Germania and Scandinavia and kept a link with their Indo-European cognate. Well, all is not lost here, as there is another god whose name did also evolve from the Proto-Indo-Europeans. And I'll talk about this more in this video, and that is the storm god Perkinus. The Old Norse and also the Old English fusion is cognate with Perkinus, the original storm god of the Proto-Indo-Europeans, and so this has led to some interesting implications, but not in the way you might think. Firstly, you know, fusion was a god in Germania, as he was a god in Scandinavia and England, and so there's a common root here, yeah, he came from the Germanic tribes. And next, Fjordjian is described in 13th century uh, Norse literature, so in the Eddas, uh, in both a male and female capacity. Now, as a woman, it is inferred that she is the personification of the Earth Mother, yeah, and so the mother of Thor, and so was a partner to Odin at some point. But Fjordjian is also referred to as a man and the father of Frigg, who went on to be the wife of Odin. And this immediately shows a pantheon affected by two separate mythologies, one that has evolved either from one to the other or into two separate lines. In effect, we have a storm god moved in the pantheon to be an earth mother or father-in-law of Odin, both of which can hold high ranks. And the change in sex isn't completely unusual in the evolution of gods and, and pantheons. But what is interesting is that Fjordjian stops being a storm god. Thor emerges or as he is known at the time, Thunaraz. And Thunaraz is not just a storm god, he is a sky god. Now, some of you will no doubt be telling me I'm mistaken, Thor is a storm god. And yes, his weapon and name infers this, but his role in the Norse pantheon, in the Norse literature, and backed up by his popularity uh, and his equivalent according to the Romans, who was Jupiter, all these indicate his role in the first millennium was as the equivalent of the Sky Father, a bigger role than just a storm god. And if this is the case, could Thor have taken the role of Tyr? And then this raises an issue, or should I say another issue with the prose edda, where Snorri Sturluson says that Tyr is the son of Odin. Um, and that's within the Scar Skalpamol, uh, which contradicts the poetic edda, which says he is the son of the giant Himir. And this is a decent summary of the problem we have. We have no definitive attestation to Tyr's position, but we do have all these remnants of things that may have happened in the Pantheon previously. So let's take a more detailed look at Tyr to understand why 
He wasn't seen as an important Norse god in the Eddas, but was important enough to have a day of the week named after him, Tuesday, and was important enough to have a role in the Ragnarok uh, of the binding of Fenrir the Wolf and then uh, the mortal wounding of Grama before he himself bled out from his wounds. And let's remind ourselves that the prose Edda and the poetic Edda, the books that give us this principal information on the old Norse pantheon, these were written in a time closer to us today than to the start of the first millennium. And this means that the stories told within the Eddas may not have been told in the time period we're interested in, so sort of pre-500 CE, meaning that any earlier versions of the stories are now lost to that time. We've discussed in previous videos how stories can be completely rewritten in the space of 50 years, let alone 500 years. That is more than enough time to completely rewrite a pantheon and its myths of creation and you know to, to appear as though they've always been written that way so understanding all this we have to examine what else remains that might help us understand who Tyr was we know in Norway Thor was the most popular god and it may have been the chief god at many places due to this popularity and this can be seen in place names, making him more popular than Odin uh, towards the end of the first millennium. I mean, it, this didn't mean he was more powerful. That's the wrong way to think of gods. He was just a more relatable god to the average person, as gods were more associated with personas and personality, as opposed, for example, being considered a god of something, such as a god of war. Now, it is unlikely that all these towns that are named uh, after Thor were named after Tyr first and then renamed. So it looks as though Tyr never made a big impact in Norway, but Thor did. And this would reflect in the fact that Thor was a sky god, a chief god, and Tyr maybe not. But if we look at Denmark, which neighbours uh, Germania, there we see 31 places, 31 sites, uh, from the earliest from the start of the first millennium up to the, sort of the fifth century of, of the first millennium, which have names that could be aligned to Tyr. These sites have been uh, where armies have been conscripted or enlisted, and these armies were known by the name as Hearth, and this hints at Tyr's role being that of a war god, not a sky god, but an important god nonetheless. Uh, and as an aside, for those who think that Odin is a war god, Odin didn't fight in battles, unlike Thor or Tyr. Odin may have instigated battles, he may have created situations to allow specific people to die in battle. He was a god associated with death and Valhall, but he was a different kind of war god to Thor and Tyr. And in fact, Odin was in many ways very different to Wotan and Woden, his Germanic equivalent. And this is something that may have influenced uh, on the roles of the gods over time as well. As during the time when these towns in Denmark were being built, the Romans were at war with the Germanic tribes conflict that went on for hundreds of years and if your war god isn't helping you win wars then is he really the right war god for you would you need a new war god but going back to place names associated with Tyr, um so i got a bit distracted there may be a couple of towns whose name could be associated with Tyr in norway but there are none in sweden and the names that could be associated with Tyr in these um, countries tend to have grown from plural or generic names for gods, not Tyr's personified name. And so again, this suggests that Tyr was certainly not as well, well, not as popular uh, in Sweden and Norway as it was in Germania, uh, certainly in the first half of the first millennium. And if a god isn't popular in those places, it suggests that Tyr wasn't leading that pantheon at that time. Now, we also have Tyr uh, mentioned as a day of the week, Tuesday, Tyr's Day. Well, in the Romance languages, Tuesday is known as Martes or Marti or similar, linking Tyr to the Roman god Mars. And so this suggests that Tyr was the equivalent of the Roman god Mars, a war god, not a sky god. The sky god of, of Rome was Jupiter. And so again, we don't see a connection with a sky father figure such as Zeus Pyta here. 
And this would suggest that Tyr is not regarded as a sky god at this point in time either, which is around the start of the first millennium. Now, because many Germanic and Norse gods were associated with war, as was the nature of the culture, then one could also argue that to be associated with Mars, the war god, meant that you were the most prominent of the war gods in that pantheon. And then we could use this as a potential evidence to show that Tyr was prominent in Germania as a war god, even if he wasn't chief of the pantheon, or known in Scandinavia very well. And we also see inscriptions by Germanic people uh, in Latin, strengthening this link between Mars and Tyr, in the Netherlands, there is a first century inscription, uh, Mars Halamand Arthus, which means Mars murder of men. And there's the famous inscription on Hadrian's wall, Mars Thingus, in the third century by Frisian mercenaries. And these particular pieces of evidence are worth remembering. That the Roman army paid mercenaries from northwestern European tribes to fight for them. And this meant that these people interacted with Romans and other people from other cultures, and they different beliefs would have influenced each other, with these modified views being taken home after their contract came to an end. But what one of these inscriptions certainly infer is that the war god Mars was the presider over the thing, the Germanic and Nordic name, for the meeting of the General Assembly. Now to preside over the General Assembly you could then argue that one could be considered a chief god, even a sky god, but this is a rather tenuous association. And if Tyr, or as he would be known in the first century in, in Germania, Tiwaz, was a celestial deity, this would have been long before there were any Germanic tribes existing. And also we would expect the inscription to refer to Jupiter if Tyr was a sky god. And so again, evidence is suggesting that this wasn't the case for Tyr. We can also see from this, and from the day of week which aligns Mars to Tyr, is that at the start of the first millennium, 2000 years ago, Tyr was seen as a war god amongst the northwestern Europeans, you know, at the beginning of the battles and the war with the Roman Empire. So we're finding out some interesting things about Tyr, but nothing definite about his position in the Pantheon. Now some information is a little contradictory, and no information is suggesting he was a sky god, but there's more information about Tyr that can be found. We have the Tiyurun of the Elder Futhark and the Old English Futhark alongside the Younger Futhark, all of which were associated with Tyr, and we clearly see this in the poetic Edda Sigtrifamur stanza 6, which reads, Victory runes should you know. If you want to have victory, carve them on the sword's hilt, some on the sheath, some on the blade. Name then Tiwaz two times. So here, we read that you must carve the tear rune onto your sword tilt, blade and sheath, and then call Tyr's name twice, if you want victory in battle, again reinforcing the message that Tyr seems to be very much a war god. And in archaeological terms we also find brackets from around the middle of the first millennium CE with images of Tyr losing a hand to Fenrir, and a tear rune, suggesting that Tyr's place in Ragnarok was established over 1500 years ago, and any events where the hand were lost were written at the latest at that part of the first millennium. And this highlights one very obvious feature about Tyr we need to mention more, and that is why did Tyr have just one hand? Now, the obvious answer is that it was bitten off by Fenrir, and if you don't know that I'll read you the shortest of two variations in Snorri Sturluson's Prosedda, which is from chapter 25 of Gilfagin in um, it goes, there is a god named Tyr, and Tyr is the boldest and most courageous, and it gives much counsel regarding victory in battles. It is good for the valiant men to call on him. There is the expression that he who is Tyr valiant surpasses other men, and does not sit around idly. He was so wise that one who is wise is said to be Tyr sage. This is one mark of his boldness, when the gods entice the friendless wolf to let them put the fetter Glepnir on him. The wolf did not trust them to let him free until they laid Tyr's hand in his mouth as a pledge. Then, when the gods would not set loose, he bit off Tyr's hand at the point we now call the wolf joint, which we call the wrist, and so Tyr is one-handed and is not called a man of peace. Now, this not only says again that Tyr is a war god and a wise god, 
But if you watch my last video on kings, we see the loss of a hand can represent the loss of power. But the passage doesn't suggest Tyr is a chief god, a sky father. But the loss of Tyr's hand also suggests Tyr was a war god and a warrior. And this is something I didn't really touch on in my last video about kings. But the wounding of a king, warrior or commoner in myth brings together a connection between the tripartite position of an individual and the microcosmic relation between man and the cosmos. And what I mean by that is there are three types of men in society, the priest or sovereign and the warrior with courage and the free man, the farmer producing food. Now, these three types of men were represented by three different parts of the body, which aligns to the way the parts of the body is used to build the earth, which I talk about in this video. Thus, a sovereign would normally suffer a head wound or a loss of an eye as an example, or the head would be chopped off. And we see this with Odin losing an eye or in Beowulf when either Grendel's mother beheads the king's top nobleman or when Beowulf beheads Grendel's mother. And in Beowulf, the lead character then, Beowulf is rewarded with advice about kingship. So there's this link between the wounding of the head and kingship. And we see these values uh, in myths where feet are injured or legs are cut off uh, or an under part of the body is attacked. For example, uh, Fenrir is bound by his foot in the prose Edda, as is Egil in the Egil saga. And we also see Wiglaf and Beowulf wounded, uh, wounded the dragon uh, in the underbelly and then are rewarded with gold and treasure. But warriors, the myths have them losing arms and hands, such as Tyr, but also Egil loses his hand in Beowulf Grendel eats a warrior by hand and feet, or you have Beowulf tearing off Grendel's arm. And Beowulf is rewarded with horses and weapons for his success, rewards for a warrior. And you see these narratives in myths from Igil Saga to Beowulf, from Gilfagining to uh, the Prose Edda to uh, Wolfarius, the Latin epic from Germany. And with this, we must ask, is seeing Tyr's hand cut off start in the process of moving him down from the upper ranks of the Pantheon? Or but does it also mean that he was a warrior and a war god, not a sky god? And this really is a summary of Tyr. And what we are left with is something resembling a multiple crime scene with a scattering of evidence of all the crimes mixed together, all hinting at something is happening. but. When everything is pulled together, we have nothing solid. But despite this, we have the question about Odin or Woden taking over from Tyr in the Norse or Germanic pantheon. And as I've explained earlier, and in other videos, Odin's development is complex. His origins aren't from the Proto-Indo-European pantheon. He was not a god who evolved with the pantheon. Odin is also not a representation of Manus or Yemo or this putter. His origins are more primitive. He's formed from the Wothu, personified to Woden, a god of death. And only in Scandinavia did his role encompass magic and the runic magic. Plus, we see that Tyr's role in Scandinavia was always much less than in Germania, meaning that if a change happened, it was either earlier in time uh, or earlier in the timeline and so embedded in the pantheon before it significantly influenced the North culture. So let us ask ourselves which is more likely from the Germanic Woden, the god of death, to take over Tyr, a war god, or Thor, a sky god and a war god. And my view is that Tyr is an ancient god. The name no doubt stems from the Proto-Indo-European sky father. He once held a high place in the Proto-Indo-European cultures, but conflict and war turned this god into a war god, a warrior god, as his principal place in the pantheon. And when coupled with the fact that Thor is a more like for like replacement for the Sky Father than Odin, then can we make a suggestion for an answer, which is to me, Odin or Woden didn't take over from Tyr in the Germanic pantheons. It was Thor. And the reason I feel this is that we see the development of Fjorgin from the Celtic tribes as they battle with the Romans in Germania alongside intertribal combat and they have Perkinas, the ancient storm god, changing to Fjorgin. Uh, at the same time Thor, the Germanic Thurnas, was created and replaced Tyr 
as a chief god, partly because of his warrior skills and partly because he was a sky god. And let's be honest here, if a sky god of a warrior race loses his sky god power, all he is left with is his ability to fight, his warrior attributes, and it may explain Tyr's injury to push him down the pantheon. And that is a shot in the dark as his cause of dethronement, but it's probably best to say Tyr and Thor are warrior gods in the true sense of the word. And we know that Thor is the equivalent of Jupiter because Thor represents Thursday, and Thursday was also to Jupiter Day by the Romans. And perhaps Thorjan giving way to Thor, but still being placed as a key figure in the ancestry of the gods and the mythology of the gods, and also an influence on Odin's life, left little room for Tyr to be placed anywhere significant. And so then was devolved under Odin. And consider within the poetic Edda, these poems are probably more authentic look at the old Norse history than the prose Edda. And Tyr's ancestry within the poetic Edda hinted that being the son of Hymir, the, the Jodan, being known as his father, this would fit comfortably with the myth of creation, where the gods and the Jodans must have mixed rather than Snorri's suggestion that Odin was his father. And we also have to bear in mind that this change wouldn't have been immediate and widespread over Europe. It would take time. It may have happened as Uthor and Odin combined in Scandinavia. And there must have been a perceived benefit to the tribes in, in doing this. And perhaps this rise of Othin also influenced the change of Tyr. But I remain convinced that Odin is a different type of god to Tyr, and so one that isn't equivalent to Tyr. But that discussion about Odin, I will leave for another day, because that could be quite contentious. And so we see Fjolgin move to the Pantheon to be replaced by Thor. Thor gaining power to take the sky god status from Tyr and to be more precise, the chief god status from Tyr, as Tyr was probably at that point just a war god. Odin's rise, or actually Wodin's rise, um, as this is happening in Germania, may have also been happening at the same time as the Germanic pantheon has gone through some of these changes in the first millennium BCE, so over 2000 years ago. But can we say when all this exactly happened? Well, certainly before the first century, the first millennium, judging by the archaeological record and texts that we do have from Rome. But we would also expect to see some reference to the takeover if it was that recent, and we don't. So a better guess, and it is a guess, would be the second half of the first millennium BCE, so between 2,000, two and a half thousand years ago. And this may also explain why Tyr wasn't such a well-known god in Scandinavia. In fact, he may never have achieved the role of the head of Pantheon in Scandinavia, having his power taken before he arrived there. And so that is my high level speculative answer. It's not watertight, uh, but it's a decent educated guess, considering what we know right now, considering all the possibilities of what was going on. And I hope just by getting there, it may have opened up some knowledge about the pantheons and the gods you weren't aware of and given you an answer you can work with, discuss and challenge. And so please, if you have any questions, ask them below and I'll either answer them below or if necessary, make a second video on this topic due to the speculation involved. So uh, if you enjoyed that, please click the like button too. If you found this interesting and informative, it means a lot to me and it costs nothing and helps this channel grow. And with that, until my next video, please stay safe and stay well. And this was Crack and Ford.